Welcome and thank you for joining our candidate forum for the Chico Unified School District. My name is Linda McMichael and I'm a very proud member of the League of Women Voters of Butte County. The League of Women Voters has over 700 chapters every state in the United States and beyond and we have a 100 year history of promoting democratic engagement and here we are tonight. Um, the, the many volunteers of the League of Women Voters actually work year round, not just during election season. They register voters, they host educational community events, and they provide voters with what we hope is pertinent and um, timely election information. While the League does not endorse political parties or candidates, we passionately believe the candidate forums are essential to the democratic process. And here we are tonight, and we certainly hope that our candidates and our viewers um, find this to be beneficial. I would like to say, oh, we had Claire up. Um, I wanted to take a minute to thank Claire Green. Claire Green is not only our IT person, she's also the chair extraordinaire of the candidate forums and she has put all of these together and it is an incredible amount of work. And of course, um, moving the format to virtual was yet another challenge, didn't bother um, Claire. So I would like to take a minute to thank her. So. Yeah, thank you, Claire. So we have a mere 21, 29 days before the election um, happens in November, so we better get started. The Chico Unified School District has 23 schools with approximately 12,000 students. They have an annual budget of just over $100 million. Um, they have a governing board of five members and there are two positions open this November. Tonight we have six candidates. They have all joined us and they will be on the ballot in November. Um, to our audience, we thank you so much for joining us. To our candidates, thank you for running. And we, I'm sure this is un unnecessary for me to say, but we do um, say this to all of our forum candidates. Thank you in advance for being courteous to so let's begin. Here is the format. The format is that you will each have a two minute opening. We have five questions. You will have one minute to, to answer the questions and you will have a two minute closing. We randomly selected the initial order of the way the questions would be answered. So we are going to start with Carrie Kruger and you have a two minute opening, please begin. Unfortunately, our school board has been accused of being out of touch and complacent in decision making on behalf of the students, parents, and teachers in our community. I have entered this race to remedy that. As a parent of a middle schooler, I bring a current hands-on perspective that's in touch with the everyday realities of raging, raising and educating a child in this season. We are all facing uncharted territory in education. It's paramount for our school board to advocate for the parents, teachers, and students in our community. As a member of the school board, I will advocate for the parents, teachers, and students with these core beliefs as my guide. Parents are overall smart, invested, and completely capable of making the best possible decisions for their children. Every single child deserves to be seen and supported, they are our future. Teachers are heroes and should be honored and respected and recognized as such. Thank you. Ms. Hubby, you are next. Well, good evening and thank you to the League for this opportunity. Uh, as a, an incumbent on the Chico Unified School Board, I'm seeking reelection for a third term because I still have work to do. I have a penchant for public service. In addition to the eight years I have been on the Chico board, I've served on the Bangor Elementary School Board, the Butte County Grand Jury. I've also been involved with several service organizations and I have been employed by several nonprofit organizations and have donated my time to several nonprofits as well. 
Uh, going forward, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, although I studied accounting post high school, I spent the first 15 years of my career uh, in social services, both public assistance and employment and training. The majority of my time in public in employment and training was working with at risk underserved foster homeless and at risk youth in helping them to become self sufficient and complete their education. Uh, the second half of my career is where I dusted off my accounting skills and I became a business manager and worked for over 13 years at two California charter schools as their business manager. A biz as, my, as a business manager, I was not only responsible for the upper level high finance accounting reporting and budgeting, but also the day-to-day -day operations of the school, the programs and services, the general well-being of the students and the staff. So these combined skills of working as a business manager, my eight years experience on this board, my background in social services make me uniquely qualified to continue for another term on the Chico Unified School Board. I look forward to finishing the work that we have begun. And I thank you, thank you for you, Mr. Tannis. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, Mr. Tannis, I think you're on mute. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Matt Tennis is my name. I'm a, a rice farmer. I'm a father of uh, four beautiful kids who are in Chico Unified enrolled currently, uh, or one, one of whom is only two years old and so has yet to be enrolled. Um, so I'm very invested in this district, which right now is in crisis, and the community that the district serves is in a state of crisis right now, uh, as we are all aware. And the COVID lockdown has had um, an outsized effect, negative effect on working families in our community. And as a parent of a family where both parents do work, my wife has a business downtown that we own together and I myself am a farmer. Um, I'm keenly aware of the stresses that are being placed on parents right now to oversee their children's education in a Zoom-based environment that frankly is not effective uh, for many, many, many children. Uh, and so a top priority for the school district and the board of, of uh, governing board right now needs to be uh, the reopening of the schools, either in the context of uh, shifting to a, a different tier, which we're in process of doing right now, which mostly is happening on the natural, irrespective of any action that, that we're taking uh, on the board level, although we need to be attentive and proactive to embracing our shift from purple to red and opening doors as soon as possible. But also we don't have a crystal ball and so we don't know what the future uh, might hold for whether they may be more cases in the future. And so we also need to pursue an elementary waivers to ensure that our elementary schools can be open as, as quickly as possible because what our need, kids need right now is to be made whole. Uh, our community has been traumatized by a lot of uh, very significant negative events, uh, including the campfire, the dam crisis, and now COVID has been brutally difficult on not only parents of families, but also, and most importantly, the children. So Chico Unified needs to put kids first when it comes to the COVID crisis. Um, Thank, you. Am, uh, Thank you. Finished. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Get that unmuted. There we go. <laughs> so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Johnson. Uh, Michael B. Johnson, I suppose, on the ballot. Um, uh, actually, we're here in Chico. Been here since 2010. I have a large household of seven. Um, background: I had served on the on the Red Bluff Elementary School Board in uh, 2007, 2008 as an appointed member for a year when a vacancy came up. Uh, I'm a pretty busy fellow, and I, I consider public service to be. A calling, frankly. So I'm a, a, a serving member of the U.S. Armed Forces and the United States Navy as a chief petty officer on the reserves, uh, drilling out of Sacramento and San Jose. Um, we've got two of our kids graduated from Chico High, uh, two sons graduated Chico High, and then uh, two of my my daughter, uh, my daughter and my niece both graduated from Core Butte Charter, uh, Core Butte High School here in town. And I have uh, two additional daughters that graduated up at Shasta High in Reading. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about the nature of uh, our current educational system, uh, given 
how we're trying to, to come to terms with the coronavirus. Um, obviously, we're having a lot of technology issues that have come to the fore. We're trying to figure out how best to, to educate kids while they're at home, while we ride this out and hopefully have a vaccine and the ability to get back to something of our, of our working lives here. Um, I think we have to follow the science. Um, we can't rush trying to get our kids into school, um, no matter how much we all want that, as much as we feel that there's, there's damage and harm that comes to kids from not being able to socialize, not being able to interact with each other. Uh, there's still the, the, the obvious notion that what's going to happen to, to one of our kids if instead of just having the problems they have from not being able to socialize, if they end up bringing home this, this plague and they end up killing a family member because of it. Uh, that seems to be the broader concern as far as I would read it at any rate. Uh, I really want to see about a, a deeper focus in technology distance learning. I know obviously the school districts made some uh, significant strides toward there, but I think there's still a long way to go. Um, I've got a deep background in that and so would like to see uh, about bringing some of that knowledge to the table here, along with my past experience. Uh, with that, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting us here and uh, to my fellow candidates for all running, uh, regardless of what your background is. It's uh, nice to be a part of this team. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dalby, you are next. Hi everyone out there. Uh, I'm Caitlin Dalby. I am uh, in my 12th year of teaching public uh, middle school and high school. Uh, this year I'm a middle school teacher. Um, I've been a teacher for 12 years and eight years in Chico Unified teaching science at Marsh Junior High School. Uh, my background is, I'm 34 years old. Uh, my background is in uh, biotechnology and um, I have my master's degree in land resources and environmental science. So a lot of data analysis in my background. Um, as a school board member, I will make decisions based on empathy and evidence. Uh, I think that evidence-based decision-making is very important, uh, especially uh, in this day and age and with all of the uh, changes that are taking place in our society and in our community from COVID to trauma um, to natural disasters. Um, with my Chico classroom experience over the last eight years, I know I will be a strong advocate for students, families, and educators. Uh, my platform is made up of three main issues. Um, the first is a, the most pertinent in the moment uh, which we will get past this, we will get through this, and there are so many other issues that we need to be working on at the same time. So my first uh, platform issue is a safe and steady evidence-based return to on-campus learning. Uh, what that means is that we do need to get kids back onto campuses as soon as possible when it is safe and in a way that is steady and to ensure the safety and health of our entire community. Um, my second platform piece is um, to increase communication among stakeholders to drive equity and inclusion. Uh, we have a duty to um, our students to ensure that everybody has an equitable chance at success. And the third is going beyond academics to engage and empower the whole child, which includes programs that go beyond just the classroom and make sure that all of our students have opportunities for learning uh, to Thank you. Um, empower mm -hmm. them. Thank you. Ms. Griffin? Good evening. Um, I am here and I have served for 12 years on this board because I believe in public education. It is necessary to a free and democratic society. All children must be given an equal opportunity to learn and succeed. Public education binds us as United States citizens. It enables us to have shared values civic pride and love of country. It gives those of us who are willing to put forth the effort a path to improve their lives. As a school board member, I am sworn to protect and promote public education and abide by the Constitution of the United States and California. I do not take these responsibilities lightly. In the 12 years I have served on the board, I have tried to be mindful of what students need not only today, but into the future. I have helped to develop and implement a master plan for school facilities, which enabled the district to modernize schools, beautify them and improve safety on every campus. I work to provide long sought after stadiums at both high schools and improve athletic facilities. 
provide state-of-the-art performing arts center. I have worked to establish much needed career technical training programs, increase the number of advanced placement courses and provide a wider spectrum of interesting electives to better engage students. To meet the needs of a diverse school population and provide more choice for parents, I have encouraged special interest schools. My background is as a teacher first, a social worker and a public servant. I have volunteered in many capacities in addition to my service on the board. I am the best qualified to serve on this board and I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. We're gonna to move to our first question and Ms. Hovey, you'll, you will answer it first. Um, the question is, what do you like best and value most about the education offered at Chico Unified School District? And one, one minute. All righty. Well, that's a wonderful question, but I think it, there's a two-part answer to that. First of all, the variety of different programs that we offer to our students. Uh, the Oak, Oak Bridge Academy, as Ms. Griffin talked about, the career tech education uh, programs that we have in our high schools, the IB programs, uh, college connections. There's just a really wide variety of different programs that we offer students in our district. The second part of that, what I really like about our education in our district is the teachers and the staff. As Ms. Kruger said in her opening statement, our teachers are heroes. They are heroes. They have shifted to distance learning and getting ready to maybe shift back again. But without teachers and without staff, we really wouldn't have a school. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tannis. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I feel similar to uh, Linda. And I, I think that the teachers are champions and uh, having grown up through uh, the Chico Unified School District and gone to Parkview, Chico Junior and Chico High. Uh, they're my heroes. A lot of the teachers who educated me are out and out heroes to me. And um, if, if any of you are watching, you know who you are, I think. Um, I also like the facilities of the school. I think the school district is an incredible crown jewel of, of our community. Uh, all those campuses, those sites, those gymnasiums, that infrastructure, and I or especially like it when it's open and serving the people who have paid to put it there and who need those services right now more than anything. Um, so that, that's what I really, really like about our school district is that it provides a invaluable education and, and, and it provides it in person. The trouble is that right now it's not really providing it because the Zoom-based education is a total disaster. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Well, at the risk of sounding like an echo chamber here, obviously our facilities and our teachers are, are probably one of our, our greatest assets that we have. I would like to think any school district would say that. Um, I can speak from personal experience here with uh, having had my own, uh, two of my own kids that went through uh, Chico Unified and of course the two that were in uh, Core Butte Charter but still here in Chico and making uh, use of some of those facilities as they went. Um, we've had a, a really good combination of programs that's been available you know i had a, one of my sons was involved in the summer workability program at chico high you know doing campus beautification projects um another son was involved in in uh, the technology lab they have a really good information technology program at chico high uh seeing those types of services being made available are obviously very valuable but there's still the concern about what do we do right now we're in it we're in a time that we have not confronted before we've not seen this type of dynamic and while I can appreciate the notion that we've got to get back in the classroom just as quick as we can, is there's no comparison with the notion of a Zoom learning versus in person, we still have to follow the science. We still have a, this fatal disease that's out there that we haven't gotten past yet. How do we address that as our, as our immediate focus coming in the next, the next six months? Thank you. Ms. Dalby? Hi, thank you. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind uh, is our students. Um, our students are so amazing and they're hilarious and they're so unique and they bring so much to uh, 
to our community as far as um, just all of the things that they do and and how they uh, learn and act and um, they're just you know a very diverse everybody has their own uh, quirks um, and along with that our our staff um, our teachers and our uh, support staff are the hardest work <laughs> working people I know um, and they are problem solvers our teachers and support staff can solve any problem in education that you put in front of them if you put them in a room together and give them enough time and resources to do it. Um, and so I think that we all need to remember that and capitalize on the value of our, our, our educators and our students to um, drive forward some progress in this district um, to, to generate well-rounded, our real, well, black, well -rounded awesome students. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Griffin. Excuse me, Griffin. Griffin. <laughs> okay, so could you please restate the question? Absolutely. What do you like best and value most about the education offered at Chico Unified School District? Okay, uh, well, one of the things I like most is that we provide a great a variety of choices. And uh, we have different schools that provide uh, STEM education, uh, Academics Plus, two-way immersion. Uh, we have enabled uh, some charter schools that also provide a greater uh, variety of things, such as Waldorf education. Um, we have uh, striven to give parents the greatest choice possible. We also have a wide range of teachers, different abilities, different styles. Um, that are, and we, we uh, try to encourage them to create different curriculum in order to engage students. We promote that and we encourage it and we approve it once it's presented to us. And most of all, we have the best superintendent in the state of California. And from the top down is what comes our greatness. She has great staff and they are remarkable people, dedicated, and from there on down, it's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kruger. One of the things that I love about Chico Unified is that there are a lot of different options for parents um, as far as uh, what's available to, to them to be able to select the best learning models to best support their student. Um, since that's what we're all here for. I love also the flexibility our district gives um, parents and families in supporting the different needs of parents and students, whether it be independent study through Oak Bridge or in-person learning. Um, as I said earlier, I believe that our committed teachers truly are heroes. They change lives. I know all the teachers um, that I um, encountered going through elementary school and, and beyond all have impacted my life. I also love the hybrid models for secondary ed where kids can do some in-person and some at-home study. And I love the variety of programs such as the welding program, um, home ec, sports, arts, all the different things. Okay, we're moving on to our next question and Mr. Tennis, you will be answering first. Here's the question. The board operates under the authority of the California Constitution, the California State Legislature, the California Educational Code, and the California State Board of Education. To the extent possible, what would be your top three priorities in your first term? Mr. Tennis. <laughs> Um, I suppose the top three priorities in my first term would be to um, uh, lean on the science that's generally available and that the state of California is actually following um, by trying to open schools on a, uh, a, a schedule that, that honors safety. And I think that we should also um, you know, honor the need for safety in our community and among uh, the elderly parents who may be living at home, uh, safety of teachers. Children are, of course, very safe when it comes to COVID. We're, we're very fortunate in, in the current pandemic that we're facing in that children are not, uh, frankly, very at risk, especially if you're talking about primary children, their chances of um, you know, ha having a, a, a serious consequences to their own person from that are very, very slim. Um, secondly, I, uh, after opening schools up, I would put vocational education uh, and expanding that very high on my list. And uh, as a third item, I probably would uh, want to go deep in the study of history 
and the study of philosophy. And Thank I would you. want to make sure that we were getting a, a, a truth-based okay. education for our kids. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you are next. And if anybody would like me to repeat it, please let me know. Mr. Johnson. Fine, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, first priority would have to be making sure that we have uh, the necessary funding from both the county and state levels uh, in terms of the new technology access. Uh, whether we have we have already a good existing one to one initiative here within the within Chico Unified, but we need to see if the gear that we have is is current up to snuff. Do we need to be replacing? Do we need to be improving access, especially to some more more rural uh, users that are going to be in the community? Uh, need to deal with issues like for funding for lunches and the like that we again we have some existing programs are we still meeting what we need right now um, my second priority would I I, I want to make sure that we're getting back to some of the basics of educating our kids on the reality of the world in which they live you know well, all of us grew, grew up with civics classes we went through a, a curriculum that that prepared us to be citizens of our community I'm not as sure given the, the disparity that we're seeing uh, in the news media uh, that people are actually being educated and understanding the world that they live in. And third, I want to make sure that there, there was a, a sense of surety and safety that they felt like they could uh, participate in the educational process without having to worry about harming their family at home. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next is Ms. Dalby. Hi, thank you. Um, so I would say that my top three priorities in my first term uh, would be, as I said previously, a safe and steady return to on-campus learning, um, which is where we, uh, when, when it's safe, we return to campus um, in the, with the safest protocols in place in which we have uh, self-contained cohorts to minimize daily interactions among students and staff as well as uh, allows for six, at least six feet of distancing, even within classrooms. Um, I also would push uh, as soon as possible to form a community um, committee made up of multiple stakeholders of our marginalized groups uh, to review our board policies and to ensure that we are um, following uh, standards of inclusivity um, and equity in our programs here at the Unified. And um, the third one is to- Thank um, you, I'm gonna need to stop, that, stop oh, you, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Griffin, you're up next. Okay, uh, well, the, the main task that's gonna have to be tackled uh, in the upcoming months and this year is going to be assessing what learning loss has occurred during this period from March uh, until the time when we actually return to education in the classroom as we know it. So that's gonna be a major task and that is gonna be pretty much all consuming, I believe, for this board. Uh, we're going to have to assess it by finding uh, ways with the teachers to do that in a way where it can be accurate. We're gonna have to find a way, a strategy, uh, some sort of teaching uh, techniques, some sort of programs that are out there that have been proven to be effective during these periods when learning loss has occurred. And last of all, we're gonna have to effectively implement those. We're gonna have to give professional development for teachers in order for them to understand what those strategies are and how best to implement those. Thank you. Ms. Kruger. All right. Every child deserves to be seen and supported. Children thrive in in-person um, instruction settings and need to get back to the classroom. Families who aren't ready for that need to be supported at home. Our kids' mental health matters. And given the collective trauma we've seen in our community over the past few years, we must address um, this and make budget modifications to support our kids when they do get back to school. Um, our children are the top priority of our school board. Most parents are smart, informed, and capable of making the best possible decisions for their children. Their voices matter on the school board and it's essential that their involvement, opinions, and choices are advocated for. Teachers need to be honored, respected, and supported. It's essential that they have the appropriate PPE and that their needs and concerns are addressed. I'll listen to their challenges and advocate on their behalf. Thank you. Ms. Hubby. 
Well, I think I thank you. I think I need to touch on uh, the current state of affairs with our COVID-19 problem. Liz Griffin was spot on in speaking about having to tackle the learning loss. It's real, it's serious, and that will be a priority for whomever sits on the board in the upcoming years. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I also, I want children back in school. I know that they need the social and emotional uh, socialization. However, it needs to be done in a safe and sane way. So let's take that one step at a time. My One of my biggest priorities going forward in this next uh, term is really to maintain our budget and our fiscal stability. Last year, California schools narrowly missed being cut 10% across the board. And I'm afraid, I hate to say it, but I'm afraid with the current economic times, there are going to be some serious challenges ahead, and we do not want to get our district into a position where we will be spending. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question, and Mr. Johnson, you will be answering it first. The question is, what do you believe are the top three challenges facing Chico Unified School Di District over the next 12 months? <laughs> well, as uh, Ms. Hovey just mentioned, um, the, the notion that the, the tax base is significantly reduced between the aftermath of the campfires, uh, the loss of the local students that are no longer here at uh, Chico State that have chosen to remain home, as well as the state coffers having a, taken a significant hit. Uh, funds are going to be a challenge, period. Uh, we have to work with what we have, and yet, how do we, how do we make, that, uh, make that determination? Um, that would probably be first and foremost. Um, second, we have uh, a disparate kind of a spread out uh, ed, uh, student body that are that are some are here in the city, some are a little more rural. We have uh, folks obviously that are in the canyon. They've been enduring their own fire dangers recently. And so some are still students here in the district. Uh, how do we make sure that they're being accommodated, that they have means of access, that they have means of being able to provide uh, food services to them during the course of the day? If mom and dad have to work, you know, what are their kids going to do? Uh, that would be probably my next focus. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Dalby, you're next. Top three Hi, challenges. <laughs> All right, so um, I, obviously, we could probably even could take just the top challenge off. We all know that it's our smoothly transitioning to uh, back to on-campus learning. Uh, and um, as Liz brought up, it's really important that we do uh, assess the losses from this whole scenario with COVID. Um, but that doesn't just mean academic losses. We need to assess our um, the trauma that our students have experienced and really make sure that especially our most vulnerable students, our most at-risk students, um, have the support that they need to come out of this with their social and emotional state as well as their academics. Um, and we also need to keep a really close eye on that budget um, as Linda brought up. Um, it's important that we know that there are some big challenges coming down the line. Uh, and I think that this next 12 months, really sh strongly planning our budget uh, appropriately to, for, the next, for the next four years in this 12 months is gonna Thank be essential. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Griffin, you're next. Okay, well, uh, since I already stated uh, what I really think is gonna be happening in the next year, I would have to just piggyback on that idea and say, uh, we're going to have to try to find some creative ways to help these students catch up and uh, find ways to uh, provide for them the needed instruction. So that might be going to parents and asking parents to have to play a larger role in that, um, certainly notifying parents uh, of the loss. Uh, seeing if summer school might be a viable alternative, uh, alternative for us to put on so we can catch students up. And then um, putting in place maybe some uh, before starting school, like with our preschool, we have like a, a camp that we have kids go to to prepare them so that they're ready to enter school. We might want to try to do something to that effect um, you know, just see what other districts are doing and, uh, you know, copy them. Thank you. Ms. Kruger, you're next. 
I'd echo a lot of the same sentiments as everyone else. Um, obviously the return to in-person education is just critical how this is handled. Our kids are all really suffering from the effects of this. Uh, what should have been a short, really short-term thing ended up being much longer than anyone expected and they are isolated and suffering. Um, how can we support their re-entry well is a big question I have. Um, I also would agree that student learning loss is a huge concern um, and that we really, like I said before, we really need to be looking at addressing our students' mental health and trauma when they do return. Um, budget cuts from the governor are also a huge concern. How are funds going to be allocated as, as things are um, spread thinner than ever before? And I just really hope that we could take a collaborative approach in partnership with the district as we, whomever is on the board, work together to um, best serve our students. Thank you. Ms. Hubby. Okay, well, I'm going to have to repeat a few things said by others and repeat what I've said before. One of the biggest challenges is going to be that budget. Our economy is not in a good place, both in California, locally, California, and nationally, and that will trickle down and have an effect on our school district. Um, the return to in-person learning and the learning loss is going is currently and will be uh, ongoing a quite a big challenge. The third thing that I am thinking about as a challenge, and it has been a challenge for several years and will continue to be one, is the recruitment and retention of outstanding teachers and outstanding staff, especially uh, special education teachers. So. You know, we really want to strategize on how we can recruit and retain outstanding teachers and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tannis. Right. As a, uh, a business owner and, a, and an analyst, formerly one who has worked in Sacramento politics for 15 years, um, I'm very familiar with um, budgets, both on a state level and on a local government level, such as we are dealing with here with the school district. Um, and yes, uh, very, very troubled times ahead. Uh, this COVID lockdown has, has had a huge economic impact on, at, at every level, and that's going to mean fewer dollars coming in down the road um, to our school district, and it's a very serious concern. Um, I think that the learning loss problem is, um, is huge. It is going to be huge. Uh, this current generation of kids who are having to deal with this Zoom-based education are really getting a short end of the stick right now, especially since all the science points to the reality that they should be in school and in in-person learning right now. Uh, cohorts are a wonderful opportunity, and it's been there for a long time. You have the waiver process, which uh, could have moved faster than it has, and uh, we need to get our kids back in school. Harvard uh, Medical School the Thank American you. Academy of Pediatrics and CDC. Thank all you. I'm going to stop you. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to our next question. And uh, Ms. Falby, you will be the first respondent. And here's the question. As one of five board members responsible for leading Ch uh, Chico School District, what leadership experience and qualities would you bring to the job? And Ms. Dalby? Um, so I was asked one time in a job interview, uh, what's the difference between a, a leader and a boss? And a leader is somebody who rolls up their sleeves and gets in the game with their team. And I have this tremendous uh, experience as a teacher working with some of the hardest working people I know who we collaborate and work as a team so much. And um, I just know that um, with, a, with the team put together um, with our, per our current members and the potential for the two new spots, that um, if I'm in there, um, the qualities that, are, that will come together um, to lead the district will be, will be, um, will be that of the mindset that we are in this together and that we will listen to each other and that we will collaborate with each other and we will hear from our families firsthand and we will hear from our community members Thank firsthand you. in order to do what's Thank best. Thank you, I'm gonna stop you. Okay, next up, uh, Ms. Griffin, you're next. Leadership. Okay. 
Leadership qualities. Uh, well, I have a lot of leadership qualities. I have been the president of the school board for three times during the Great Recession, the campfire uh, when people were coming into Chico Unified and we had to help Paradise figure out what they were gonna do with their kids and how we were gonna help support them. Also during this COVID era where it took us all by surprise and we had to think logically, we had to consider the needs of all citizens in this community, all students and their safety. And uh, so uh, my background in law, in social service programs, in, um, in, in running those type of things has given me great leadership strengths. Thank you, Ms. Kruger. All right. Um, I think to me, what really stands out as a leader um, quality that's really important is that a leader is a listener. Um, I think that, that that is just a key quality that's missing in most of our public servants um, in our community and just, just not even our local community, just you know nationally, even on national level. So I think being a listener and then being willing to advocate on behalf of those um, that we serve. So that's something that I'm committed to. Um, I have always been a natural advocate for my daughter in whatever school setting she's been in. Um, she's in eighth grade, so for her la the last nine years of her education, that's something that I have always not only listened to her needs, but the needs of other parents and teachers in our schools uh, that she's been a part of, and then have naturally just advocate, advocated on their behalf and spoken up. Um, I've worked in a lot of different um, volunteer type positions um, where I have served the students um, in our community um, in different youth group settings and, and even overseas and in different opportunities to work closely with kids. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Hovey. All righty. Well, in addition to also having served as the board president with Chico Unified School Board, I think um, the, the 13 years that I spent as a business manager, being responsible for a charter school really showed some leadership ability. Being a business manager is not an eight to five job. Uh, one mistake can affect the lives of 400 students and their families. It was a heavy load to take. Um, I wasn't in it alone. Of course, we had a principal, but you know, a math miscalculation on a budget projection could have made everything go sour. So really the time that I have spent and successfully built a charter school from 40 students to over 400 and left them with a million dollar reserve, that I think can attest to some of my leadership skills. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tanis. Thank you. Um, I've been in leadership positions my entire professional and, and much of my personal life. Uh, as mentioned, I worked in, a, a, in government for 15 years in Sacramento um, for various people. And at one point was a, um, a high level officer in a major statewide association. Um, on the local level, I have organized a coalition of uh, working families and parents called Chico Parents for In-Person Learning. Uh, it's come together over the past two months and it already has almost 350 members. So I'm proud of the work that we're doing now to advocate on behalf of, of uh, working families toward uh, opening schools. Uh, also as a business owner and an employer, I, I know a lot of the ins and outs of what it means to um, you know, have people working with me and the collaboration that occurs in, in a professional environment as well. And then I'm the father of four very young kids. And uh, so there's a lot of leadership that goes into that as well. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right, there we go, thank you. Well, I've uh, been leading people in my professional life since 1994. I got uh, my first job out of high school. Um, I've had past school board experience. I was in senior support engineering at Apple with a staff of my own. Uh, of course, my military experience along the way, you know, I've, I've you know, organizational logistics, budgets, and really above all, managing and leading people. Um, in, complex and stressful environments. 
you know, there's a, there's kind of an old saw about leadership, you know, there, it ultimately comes down to determining options, but the first and foremost is you have to have a set of core values. You have to have principles by which you adhere to. You have to be able to evaluate your people and your resources. What do you have to work with? And above all, you need to be able to listen to your people. You need to see what are their concerns? What are the stakeholders involved? In this case, we've got parents, we've got teachers, we've got staff, we've got the kids themselves. We have to make the best decisions that we can with what we have to work with. We have to accept the consequences of those, good or bad. And finally, we have to be as flexible as we can be as the circumstances warrant and change. Okay, thank you. We are ready for our final question. And Ms. Hobie, you will be the first respondent. And here's the question. As an elected official, how do you propose to maintain the public's trust in the Chico Unified School District and its board? Mm. You know, that's a really wonderful question because one of the things that I have been working very, very diligently is to always remain transparent in everything that we do. As a board member, it is our fiduciary duty to oversee the finances of the Chico Unified School District and to be good stewards of the tax dollar. Every decision that we make I, we ask hard questions, sometimes questions that, you know, are uncomfortable, but transparency is the number one priority, and I will continue to make sure that we do that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kruger? Yes, I'd say that I'm committed to uh, representing the needs of our community and working hard to listen and be the advocate that our community needs, our students, parents, and teachers, that is. And um, also working to hold the district accountable to the will of the people that, are, um, that they serve. Okay, Ms. Griffin. Well, I think keeping the trust involves um, doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is always putting the students first not being out there seeking our own personal agendas, but finding out what is needed in our students and in the community. Uh, that also means acting responsibly. As Linda said, making sure that we are putting forth a budget that is not a deficit budget and that we're not spending in deficit and that we're always setting a good example of good communication so that our students can see that this is how democracy works. It can work among cooperative people and especially as a nonpartisan group such as we are. Thank you, Mr. Tennis. Uh, we're not putting students first right now in Chico Unified School District. Um, absolutely not. Um, as a parent who's uh, living with four of them, I can tell you that uh, the lockdown has been a disaster for these kids. Uh, they are uh, in, on their person scientifically uh, not in danger right now. And so if we want to put kids first, we should get them back in in-person school and in-person learning as soon as possible. Um, because of my background in government, uh, I am a person who knows how government is supposed to work. I understand governmental policy and procedures and uh, how boards are supposed to operate and how public comment is supposed to operate. And I think that uh, one key element to restoring trust will be diversity on the school board. And I would like to bring diversity because my perspectives are and my approach to things is, is different from, from what's already there. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Well, um... I'm sorry, I, 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 have to, I have to take a moment. I, I have deep concerns about what I just heard. Um, regardless of whether I'm gonna be successfully elected to the board or not, uh, I've gotta follow the science here. And the fact that our kids, whether or not they are themselves at risk for coronavirus, uh, doesn't change the fact that they live with families, they live with aunts, they live with uncles, they live with grandparents. The, the notion that these, these youngsters, is, as hard as this is right now for them to be at home and to not be getting the quality education they want, they're getting oh, Mr. Johnson. services. 
Excuse me. Can, can I just refresh your memory on the question and that was regaining or, or maintaining the public's trust? I understand, okay. ma'am. And, and we're trying okay. to speak to that question right here. Uh, my okay. concern is, is no, we can't regain any trust if we're not speaking truth to power. And if we're going to be in a position of power, we have to be able to speak to the, the notion that our kids, whether they like it or not, we're in this position right now for the next at least three to six months, if not longer. It's not responsible for us to even suggest for anybody to suggest that it's okay for our kids to be going back to school right now, that they're in no danger because whether they are or not, their parents and family members are, their community is. And that's just, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Dalby. Hi. <clears throat> um, so to maintain or to build up public trust, um, transparency has been mentioned. Um, and I think that that's a pretty straightforward uh, consideration. Uh, we should always be transparent in the decisions we're making and especially how we are spending money and implementing programs and hiring staff. Um, also communication. Uh, so transparency goes so far, but sometimes transparency is passive, but we need to be active communicators. We need to elicit information from our stakeholders, from our students, from our families, and do it in a way that is scientifically sound. Sometimes the data that's being gathered by the school district is not uh, scientifically sound data gathering, unfortunately. Um, so we're not always getting the complete picture. And then also to be able to admit when you're wrong and demonstrate how you're learning from those situations and growing from them and making changes. Um, it's really important to, um, to make sure that the community knows Thank that you, you are I'm, going to be flexible I'm in gonna stop you there. Process. Okay, we are at the point where we will do our closing and you have any time up to two minutes, one or two minutes or some, some place in between. And um, we will begin with you, Ms. Griffin, for your closing statement. Okay, um, in conclusion, I have been a member of the school board for 12 years. Being a member of the school board requires vision. You have to keep in mind not only today, but well into the future. What will that future be like? How can we best prepare our students for that future? What are the essential tools that they will need? We know how quickly our society is changing. We need to give all of our children a fair shot at success. Through early quality childhood education, we now have preschools on several of our sites. We can begin the process of equalizing the playing field for those students. We can provide a quality education in the elementary years to prepare students for a better education in their later part of their secondary education, where they will be able to choose whether they want to go further academically or if they wanna choose more hands-on career technical education, whatever is best suited for them. We want every child to have an opportunity to fulfill his or her, her dream for the future. So what I would like to see is that we continue with this board, which is a cooperative, productive board. We have been able to achieve wonderful accomplishments, and I want to see those things continue. To have a divided board, to have our board turn into something that becomes politicized would be the worst possible thing that could happen. So I would urge voters to consider that very strongly. If you like the things that have happened over the past 12 years, please continue with the incumbents and you will see the change and uh, improvements continue. Thank you. Ms. Kruger. Thank you so much to the League of Women Voters for having me tonight. I am a team player that's excited um, and, to, and, and has a deep passion for this community and the future leaders that we're raising. I feel um, called to collaborate and to be a part of the solution on our school board. We, like I mentioned earlier, we are facing uncharted territory in education and it's important for our school board to advocate for the parents, teachers and students in our community and work on behalf of the educational excellence of the children in our district. Chico needs a change and I'm excited for the opportunity to be a part of the solution. I am hopeful for the future because I see it in the eyes of our children. 
Thank you. Ms. Hovey? I wasn't quite ready yet, but I'll go forward. <laughs> so as a vision for the future, the, one of the most important things is the collaboration between board members, the district, and the district staff, as well as our students. It's paramount that we all communicate and collaborate. Going forward as well, though, I have talked about this several times this evening. I really feel that as a board member, you need to be prepared to have the fiduciary oversight of the Chico Unified School District budget, which at the beginning of this event was said to be over a million hundred million dollars. That's no easy task. My 13 years as a school business manager, along with my eight years on this school board has given me the knowledge, the experience and the skills to safely navigate Chico Unified through the coming challenges ahead. And I would hope for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tennis. Um, I agree with um, much of what was said about collaboration among colleagues on the board. And, and I don't wanna send a, a, an inaccurate message about uh, you know, what sort of person I am. Uh, I've been collaborating with people for years. Uh, I've been a, a youth leader. And um, as I said, I've, I've worked in, in government and I, I know how government works. Um, I've, I've sat on the Butte County Water Commission for the last um, three years. And that's been a very collaborative experience which I've enjoyed uh, with working with my colleagues in that context. Um, I'm a natural leader. I understand how government works. And I think I could bring very valuable perspective to the governing board. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. There we go. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, um, as hard as this current board has worked to deal with uh, what is really, I guess, an unprecedented crisis, uh, I firmly believe that we can do more. And I think that we're going to have to. Uh, frankly, I think the board would be served with some new ideas and some new blood as an institution, uh, we are in uncharted waters right now. And uh, whether we like it or not, we need to be rethinking some of what we're doing right now. Uh, ultimately, the mission is to educate our kids. Are we doing what's needed to make that happen? As we are looking to recruit new teachers to fill vacancies, we need to find teachers that through an aggressive recruiting process that, and salaries that can attract new educated teachers that not only can teach, but they're flexible enough and familiar enough with the technologies to be able to adjust if this continues on if we have other circumstances that come about they're going to need them to be flexible in that manner you know we are where we are whether we like it or not and i think that we can move forward i think that we really do need to have a couple of new uh, new ideas new new blood in the system as it were so uh with that i, I have nothing else for myself other than just simply like to say thank you to the leaders of women voters uh miss green and uh, all of my fellow candidates for stepping up you know regardless of how this election goes uh, I think we're going to be in good hands. And so for that, again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Dalby. Thank you. Um, I just want to close with saying that uh, I am a natural leader and advocate. Um, it's who I've been since before I was an adult, um, serving on multiple committees, uh, heads of committees in school districts for curriculum adoption, uh, standards uh, review, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have much experience in the behind the scenes workings of education. I see firsthand how school board decisions and how superintendent and, and, and uh, district leadership decisions trickle down to our classrooms. I see how it affects our students. I see how it affects our families and especially our most vulnerable um, at risk students and families. Um, my current classroom experience through the trials of our community has faced these past few years, not just with COVID, but with the campfire, um, with jobs and mental health issues in our community, um, just the fragile structure of the North State with um, trauma. Um, I, I've seen the cracks in our educational system exposed 
and I, I see the need to provide opportunities for our students and our families to be able to have flexibility and um, encouragement and empowerment within the school system to thrive, not just academically, but as a whole, um, as a whole system, as a whole family, as a whole student. Um, and we, we can do that with, uh, with smart leadership that's, that's based on re, you know, the most current research. Um, with the support of our community, I will ensure that our schools meet those diverse needs of our students under these ever-changing circumstances. Um, and I hope that uh, with this and my message that I, I have earned your vote, and if not, Thank that you. you at least find these matters. Thank you very important. much. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our formal, the formal portion of our candidate forum. Uh, to the candidates, we'd once again like to thank you. Your passion comes through. Thank you for running. Thank you for being here. Uh, to our audience, we can't see you, but we know you're out there. And please, to everyone, please be sure to vote on November 3rd. Thank you very much.